Welcome to the Aceman, everybody. It's time to go behind the funny. This is Scott Higgins. And this is Ace Aceto. And thank you for joining us. Thank you for downloading us. Thank you for subscribing. We appreciate it so very much. And if you have a moment, please give us that five-star written review wherever you download your podcast. It's a great way to help the podcast. If you want to help us out another way, tell a friend. We all learn about podcasts from our friends' recommendations, and that's a way you can help us out by recommending us to a friend. And the last way, if you really enjoy the show, is to go to our Patreon page and become a patron. And that is at www.patreon.com forward slash behind the funny. And what that will get you, it's one simple giving level, $5 a month. That will get you a T-shirt or a mug, some sort of merchandise, as well as unlocking bonus content that only our patrons can access. Thank you so much for supporting us. If you want to reach out, you got a question for us, you got a comment, anything, please send us an email at behindthefunnypod at gmail.com. And now, enjoy the show. Be careful, he's... And and, and Scott Higgins, both of them coked up out of their minds. (laughs) (laughs) Ah, listen to you. (laughs) Down in the basement. Oh, I love that. I think we should call this the acement. The acement, yes. yes. What do you think oh. there, huh? I like that. I the acement that. studios. Oh. Excuse me, I'm drinking beer. Hold on a second. We, we usually drink bourbon on our end. <laughs> yeah, yeah right. Our podcast, so <laughs> that's all right. Feel free to enjoy yourself. Yeah, exactly. You, you shoot an eight ball if you want. We don't care. As long as it's good stories. <laughs> And thanks for joining us, you guys. We are so excited. we got a great guest this week. But before we get started, from our buffet of bourbons. <laughs> we have a problem. We have, yes, we, we do. definitely have a problem. I think one week we just got to have a meeting here, not even have an episode you of know, the podcast. The sad part is it was bad enough when we had like comics on who were in recovery or who were, <laughs> you know, 10 years sober, and there was one bottle on here. Now we have a goddamn we're bar just, going on. We're just building a collection, but um, I brought one in this week that I've been wanting to try for a while. It's not available in our area, um, so I ordered it online, and it finally got delivered, and I was excited. Nice. So I brought it in. It's called Low Gap. Uh, Which is also Scott's nickname. Yes, yes. actually, that was my high school nick- nickname, <laughs> Low, Low Gap. Gap. <laughs> uh, straight bourbon whiskey uh, out of California. Yeah. Um, so here here to you, Clinkies. my friends, Clinkies. So, low gap bourbon. Mm. Very good. Very smooth. Very it is. Smooth. I it, like it. Yeah, it's it's um, it's made in cognac pot still, and it is uh, mm-hmm. uh not aged for. <laughs> you said pot. <laughs> it's not aged very long, so it's got a very nice smooth taste to it. So, uh, if you can get your hands on it, try it. Yeah. Along with our many other <laughs> selections from from our bar here. So yeah. um but we got a we got a very uh, you know what? Somehow how did I know you would not wait a whole year <laughs> to work in something that'll remind us of Scott Tober? You know, it was just timing. Just when we get into the holiday season, <laughs> you know, I figured, hey, wait a minute. I, let's take one last grasp at, at Scott Tober. We were far enough away for me to feel comfortable yeah. and get into we, my Noel spirit. Yeah. Well, in, in, in all fairness, this guy is a comic. And he started in comedy. And he's one of those guys. You know, we were talking before we went on air. And he's one of those guys that started around the same time as me. But he was in Boston. I was in Rhode Island. And just around the time I started going to Boston, we never got to work with each other. But we saw each other at like yeah. the Comedy Connection Christmas parties and stuff. It's so amazing to me, the, the stories from back in that time, how separate those two scenes really were. Right. And it's not like, you know, it's really, it's not as like. It's not as bad as that now. No, no. But um, but no, he was, and, and it was never like a, you know, not like a rivalry. A rivalry. Thing. It, was just it was just two separate, separate scenes. And uh, and so you know, by the time uh, I started going up there, he moved away, and we'll you know talk to him about his story. 
But the other reason why I had him on is because he recently wrote a book and that is not like comedy. And, you know, he even said to me, he said, well, it's, you know, I'm not doing as much comedy. I did this book and it has nothing to do with comedy. But um, I said, well, it's called Behind the Funny. And that's what we want to do is we want to learn about comics, but about all aspects of their life, about what else do they do besides comedy? You know, we all have other things that we do. And that's one of the things that we bring to the stage is our background. Right, right. And so uh, we're very excited to have uh, the very funny and very scary. Oh, lovely. Todd Parker. <laughs> there he is. Hey, guys. Hey, thanks so much for being on, man. We really appreciate it. No, thanks for uh, having me. <clears throat> so, uh, so we're we're virtual now because you're no longer. You started in the Boston area, right? Did you grow up in Boston? I grew up in Revere, Massachusetts. Okay, I grew up in the Revere of Rhode Island, which is North Providence. So very similar. <laughs> I, 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 thought was, I thought the Revere of uh, Rhode Island was Cranston. Well, it's the Cranston Johnston North Providence Triangle of Guidom. Guidotum. Guidotum. <laughs> it's the Italian triumvirate. You've lived in Coventry too long. I know. You've gotten know, that out of so your system. Far away. <laughs> I pronounce my R's and INGs yes. now. Yeah, you do. <laughs> no, yeah, yeah. My, my R's might come out, they might not, because my family just left for Thanksgiving. So while they were here, <laughs> I got my accent back. So I, you, you grew up in Revere, and now where are you living now? I'm in Atlanta now. Oh, wow. All yeah, right. Atlanta, Georgia. I uh, I started in Revere in 1988. I think you started in 89, right? 89, yeah. It was just a year after. Yeah, I started in a, a little place called uh, Michael's Seaside. It was a restaurant on Revere Beach. Oh, wow. And I had just turned 21, and I was biking. I used to bike up and down the beach every night, you know, and I was passing this restaurant, and I realized, wait, I'm 21. I can go in there and get a beer. And I thought, <laughs> oh, that'd be cool. I'll be a grown up and go and do that. And I went inside and there was all this noise coming from the second floor. And I went upstairs and there was a comedy show going on and it was Larry Rapucci. You know, Larry. Oh, oh my yeah. God. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> we have heard many stories about Larry Rapucci. Legendary, <laughs> legendary Boston scene comedian. Tom, Tom Cotter told a, a hilarious story. One about of the him, greatest we'll, stories we'll talk, ever. To a, we'll talk about that after because you may okay. have already heard it. <laughs> so um, I had... <clears throat> I'd actually been wanting to try stand up and I called Nick's maybe three times and set up an open mic date and I chickened out every time. Mm -hmm. And I went in and as I walked up the stairs, Pooch was doing a show. There's maybe six people in the crowd. Yeah. Sit at the bar. And I had to walk past him to get you know, walk right by him. And as I walked by him, he went, Hey, you comedian? And I said, No. And he went, Then sit the fuck down. And I went and sat down. Yep. And at the end of the show, uh, I said, Hey man, I really like to try that. And he said, well, come back next Saturday night and I'll, I'll give you five minutes. And I went, oh, cool. Oh, and that's wow. what happened. I went back the next week and uh, bombed my ass off. But I got one <laughs> laugh. Loved it. That's all it takes is that one laugh and yeah. then, then you're hooked. Now, mm -hmm. you said you'd been wanting to try it. Is this something like from the time you were a kid or at some point someone said, oh, you're funny, you should try it? What was that trigger that made you start thinking about trying stand up? Um, I knew that I was pretty funny and I, I would always get laughs. Mm -hmm. You know, in big groups, I would always get a few laughs. Right. And I think, uh, like a lot of comics, watching comics on TV. Yeah. I yeah. Like, I'm funnier than that dude, you know? Like, yeah, especially I, at that time, because in the late 80s, that's when you started seeing 15,000 comics on oh, TV. It was, yeah. you know, Evening at the Improv and comedy. the Comedy Channel had just launched and, right. you know, was looking for talent. So, yeah. To your point, there were some good comics. There were some not so good comics. Yes, I said to your point. Uh, we have a little drinking game on here. Whenever I say to your point or he says 100%, we drink. So I don't mean to. It just well, happens. I'll All right. You on that. Thank you. <laughs> but, but it was. There were so many comics out there. And... Well, actually, there weren't so many comics out there. There weren't a lot of comics. I was, so I, they were starved for content at that point. So you would see some really funny people, but you'd see some pretty shitty people, too. Because yeah. we had we had Art Bell on. He was the guy that came up with the concept for comedy, the, the comedy, comedy channel, channel yeah. and pitched it. And he said that how starved they were for content when the channel first launched and they, they were just going er anywhere and everywhere to clubs trying to find stuff that they could record and put on there in the wow. beginning just to try to get it launched and going oh, you amazing. know 
So, yeah. So was that room that um, Michael Seaside, was that Rapucci's room? Yeah, that was his room. He booked okay. it every Saturday. And my first maybe six weeks was only doing that place. Okay. Yep. So by the time but, I started trying nicks and stitches, I was just already kind of a little battle hardened. Like I, you know. Yeah. <laughs> getting in front of more than six people i was like whoa this is incredible yeah exactly well and that's the we talked about it before like i started in 89 but i didn't start going up to boston until 92 because my mentor down here was a guy named charlie hall and he said listen don't go up to boston and suck suck down here and then once you get good enough that you're getting good feedback then go to boston and do your five minutes you know? i love charlie hall oh yeah so you know charlie yeah 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 He's still Charlie's around great. I know. I with me. Yeah, I see him on Facebook. He put some great artwork on there. Yeah, he actually did. Uh, we recently had an actual physical location about ten years ago. You remember Rock and Joe Hebert? He was no. another Rhode Island guy. He did a lot of song parodies. Mm -hmm. um, but he started the Rhode Island Comedy Hall of Fame, and we finally just after ten years found a home because uh, Charlie made the joke when we he was the first inductee. And when Charlie was inducted, he said, yeah, the Rhode Island Comedy Hall of Fame, not so much a hall as a website. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so we finally got an actual home uh, at a local comedy club. And uh, Charlie did caricatures of all of us that are in the hall. And it's, it's oh, pretty cool. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it kind of brings you back to the Periwinkles days when he did his, you know, the caricatures of, of all the comics throughout New yeah. England. Um you know, that's how you knew you made it at Periwinkles. If you got your picture up on the wall from a Charlie Hall drawing, you know, with a black that's, marker. That's kind of your right, right of passage. Yeah, it was. Yeah. I used to think about the same thing at Stitches. Like, I, if I met somebody whose photo was on the wall. Yeah, like, yeah. The first time the I met Jackie Flynn, I was like, wow, you're, you're famous. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you have your pictures on the wall. <laughs> yeah. I, I told him that recently. He thought it was the funniest thing in the world. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was the same thing. Any club you went in, if you went up to the Portland, Maine Comedy Connection, there were only so many people that were on those walls. C you City, know? City Steam in Hartford was the same thing. The the big regular headliners, they blew up their headshots yeah. like posters and hung them in the place. And the first time I worked with one of those guys, I was like, holy shit, you're, you're in the main room, the big poster. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's crazy what used to make you feel good. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> now, now you're looking for 50 million likes on Facebook. <laughs> you know? Yeah, how, how th times have changed. So you started there, and then you yeah. made your way to Nick's. and. Yes. Was it like open mic night at Nick's? Just oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It was open mic night. I think my first time Kevin Knox was hosting. Fucking oh, Kevin, Kevin Knox. <laughs> oh you guys. How's your, how's your cock? <laughs> how's your cock? You young guys. I can't do it anymore. I can't do it. You guys are all over the place. You're young. You're virile. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> we love Kevin Knox. We oh, thought about doing an episode of just having. Like a two-hour episode where everyone comes on and just tells, tells Kevin their favorite stories. Kevin stories, you know. Uh, he was the greatest guy ever. Yeah, absolutely. Know, yep. he, just, uh, he, was, he was the mentor to everybody. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Because he was positive. He was, he was not threatened by someone being good in front of him or right. after and, him, you know. There weren't very many cases where anybody could ever affect how he did anyway. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. You know? But I remember yeah. he would like pull me aside. I was so new and he would pull me. Well, then when I was maybe like a, a year in, maybe a year and a half in, I was getting into doing crowd work. I just loved doing crowd work. Yeah. And, uh, and sometimes it went well and sometimes it didn't. Yep. But I used to get lost. And Noxie was when he pulled me aside. He goes, hey, look, you know, uh, I can't do the voice. Yeah. He's like, hey, look, uh, you want to do crowd work? That's fine. But, you know, find a place to do it. Like designate a place in your act to do it. Like say. Right. Uh, 10 you're going to do it but then know where you're going to come out be ready like have something waiting to come out to to win a land right right and, and that like, oh, that's oh, great that's advice yeah, yeah that's that's really great advice it. because never you never feel lost then because right. you've you've assigned this section where you know okay if it's going good great if it's not going good i know i'm going to come back over here and end the show that, and that, that was the amazing talent that noxie had is my my first time 
on stage in Boston was Noxie's Monday night at, at the Connection, Faneuil mm-hmm. Hall. And he, every single person that went on stage, he said something to after they sat. And, you know, a lot of people, it was their first night or even just their second night, and they did not do well. But mm-hmm. he would find something positive to point out in their act, like that joke you did about this or that thing you yeah. did with this. Yeah. He would find that one thing and go, oh, keep working on that or you should do this and and kind of just bring it around full circle for them and get them excited and, and keep them positive. He always was so good at doing that. And not everyone did that. No. Not every no. host headliner <laughs> did that did for not. you. No. Very, no. no. <laughs> less, anything, less did than didn't. Yeah. If anything, <laughs> some of them you came off stage and they were like, you went 12 seconds over, asshole. Yeah. <laughs> right. Come back in four weeks well, now. Or, or the know? ones that come up to you when you're hosting going, is he going over and the guy just started? Like yeah, a minute yeah ago. exactly. <laughs> yeah. No, Noxie always had a kind word. And, yeah. Yeah. So who were who were some of your classmates, as we say, like who you you mentioned before we went on Robbie Prince, who's a a guy who's been brought up on this podcast a bunch of times and I want to get him on. But uh, who else was in that class? uh, My class was Robbie Prince, Joe Rogan. Never heard of him. Simmons. No, no. Uh, A guy named Tommy Dunham. No. Uh, Yeah, I remember Tommy. Um, I I got to work with Tommy many, many times. Who? Jim Loletta. Jim. Yep. We've had Jim on. Um, Cotter, Cotter, I think was started just before me, but he still was part of our group. Yeah. Yep. And, uh, what about do charm? I'll do charm too. Yeah. I always, I always thought he started a little before me because he was, still yeah. Seasoned. I, yeah, yeah, I think him and Cotter started around the same time and that's the same thing. Like Cotter, Fitzsimmons, Rogan, all those same guys all used to come down to Periwinkles on Wednesdays and Thursdays too. Mm-hmm. So I remember see, you know, I that was like. You know, they were the upperclassmen. They were the guys that we were like, wow, you moved up right to the free yeah. showcase night. <laughs> you still don't get paid, but it's a showcase. Right. Yeah. Last Saturday, you got $25 yeah, to do exactly, a spot. Yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs> or we had uh, a couple of months ago, we had Tommy Morin on. Do you remember Cato and Morin? Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah, we had Tommy on a few months ago. He's still crazy out of his mind. Oh my so you god! Get, we get like all of a sudden it's like, Tommy, are you trying to get work from me? Because why are you sending me a set? He'll, he'll you send you an hour video at two o'clock in the morning. Yeah. Though, hey, thought you might want to take a look at this. I'm like, are you crazy, Tommy? <laughs> <laughs> I have no work for you. Destroy. Oh my god, those guys were crazy. So, uh, so you got to work with you know with all those guys, and then did you move up to you know? You moved up, obviously. Did you move yeah, up around I, here before you moved away? Um, yeah, I think I worked my way up to Midland, the yep. downtown rooms, and closing all the outside rooms. Yep. You know, and um, sometimes closing the the downtown rooms. You know, every now yeah. and then. Yeah. Um, on, yeah, on a Wednesday night or a Sunday yeah, night right, type right, of right, yeah, 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 yeah. The typical path we we all took. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um. My first time at Nick's, my first paid time at Nick's, I remember I was opening up. It was Don Gavin's night. Yeah. And uh, this was just very humbling. I don't remember who the middle was, but um, remember how they used to in the Herald on Fridays or Thursdays, they used to put the ads in of what the comedy scene was doing that weekend? Yeah. Well, uh, for whatever reason, they put my photo instead of Gavin's. <laughs> And it said Todd Parker with this awful headshot that I had like taken myself and yep. And I start my phone started ringing and and Mike Clark called me and uh, he was like, hey, how how did your photo? You know, Gavin's headlining. Why is your photo there? I'm like, I don't know. I have no idea. Right. I didn't do it. Uh, And I said, but you know what, Mike? It's 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 time for him. He's a dinosaur anyway. (laughs) You need need some new blood in there. <laughs> and uh, and I, I didn't think anything else of it. So Mike yeah. called Gavin, and when I show up that night, Gavin walks up to him and he goes, uh, "Dinosaur, huh?" Oh I, no! He threw you under the I, bus. I was just kidding. I was just kidding, Gav. And he goes, "Yeah, you're not gonna have a good set tonight. I can tell." Oh, so, he totally got in your head. <laughs> oh, he, he did more than get in my head. So normally, you know how it works on the Boston scene back then. Whoever the host was, it isn't like anywhere else in the country. The host right. is the head. Yeah, so, exactly. Yeah, Gavin would normally do like five, bring up the opener, do another five ten, bring up the middle, you know, and then and then close with like half hour. Right. In this case, he he go he brings up uh, um, 
Wait, what? Did he, he did like 45 ahead of me. Like he just. <laughs> I was just gonna say he blew it up, didn't he? Yeah, he did, he said, "Okay, I'm just, I'm gonna I'm gonna do a few minutes and bring you up." He did 45 solid rapid fire, like <laughs> cocaine rattled. Like he's normally so rapid fire. This was like intense. I, <laughs> he's I, I, on a mission. Like the, the audience couldn't even breathe. They were just like <laughs> they, there was gasps, and I, I was throwing <laughs> sheets. And I he, he introduces me like, uh, "Oh, you guys have been fantastic." Okay, coming up, Todd Parker. Just like that. Oh, oh it doesn't dude. even give you an intro. Not even. Yeah. And I walk up and my hand is like shaking as I grab the mic and I'm like, Don Gavin. And I, and I tried as best as I can. Hey, one more time. Don Gavin. And yeah. I could not buy a laugh. I was, oh I was dead, God. dead in the water for 20 minutes. I was just <laughs> pathetic. They were yelling. They were screaming. Were, oh, it was awful. Awful. <laughs> and I, I crawled off stage. I went, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I, I was kidding. It. I was kidding. And like, ah, it's all right. And then, and then like, it never even happened. Exactly. Like, yep. Yeah. Well, Oof. who was it that was just on not long ago? They said all of a sudden they like Lenny, Gavin, everyone like just disappeared from the room and left them on stage. And when he went outside, they and were all sitting outside, in the car. Yeah, outside. They were sitting in the car and they said, how'd it go, kid? You know, come <laughs> oh, on. Let's it, go. Was it Harrison? Oh, it was Harrison Stebbins. Harrison Stebbins. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He said that was his initiation. It's so funny. They, oh they blew God. it up, brought him up on stage, and let him try to weasel his way through it. And then when he walked outside, they went, hey, kid, how'd it go? <laughs> <laughs> They're all sitting out in the car outside. But that that's kind of how you got initiated up in Boston. That's, yeah. a, that's how they, they, they said That's probably that. why Charlie Hall told me to stay the fucking Providence until I got halfway decent, I, you, you know? Le- you you learn quick. They, yeah. You know, like. Kind of. brutal. Yannetti, oh, you yeah. Know, once. You know Joe Yannetti, of course? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So he, uh, my first road gig was opening up for him at uh, John Martin's Manor in Maine. Yeah. Waterfield, Maine. It was yep. a Mike Clark gig. And uh, I forgot my watch. And I only had like 15 at the time anyway. Yep. So I just did what I had. And uh, before I went up, he said, hey, uh, go have fun, whatever. I did my time. I came, as I'm coming off stage, I introduce him. He whispers in my ear, you did seven fucking minutes and then keeps walking. Oh, and like, oh shit. And the whole time he's up there, I'm just like, is my career over? Like, is he going right. to tell Of course. One at the time. And he comes off stage and I said, hey man, I'm really sorry. I'm really sorry. He's like, about what? I go, you said I did seven minutes. He goes, oh, I'm just fucking with you. <laughs> I'm I like, could see oh, you, Nettie, doing that. Yeah, you did your 15 yeah. and he's fucking with you. Now you, you're Ooh, sitting through his whole 45 minutes going, oh, my God, I'm never going to get a gig <laughs> yeah. again with this guy. Oh, yeah. that's yeah. funny. Yeah. Yeah, I remember John Martin's manner because I did uh, with Eddie Regine. He oh, had me okay. open up for him up there. And John Martin was, you know, Andrea Martin from SCTV. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's yeah. her brother. That's no. her brother. Yeah. Really? Yep. Oh, I'd assume John Martin was like yeah. some. Colonia, colonia. No, well, there was a guy up in that area, up in Waterville, Maine, that booked some comedy, and his name was John Martin. So I'm almost positive that's got to be the same guy. Wow. It was Andrea Martin's brother. Yeah. He was a nice guy. But, uh, hmm. but yeah, it's so funny. And, you know, you don't hear of those road – I mean, we still get road gigs. Not like that, bit, but not like not that. Not like that. But, again, that was back in the boom when, you know, everyone had the downtown clubs. And then, you know, Mike Clark alone probably had 30 friggin' clubs, you know, out out in the outskirts. And then you had Billy Downs and you had Paul Barkley and you had, you know. Like in the documentary, when stand-up stood out, they said people would throw up a placard out front that said comedy. Now they're a comedy club. Exactly. You know, every every bar around, every place had comedy at least one night a week. And like they said, you could literally work a paid gig seven nights a week and so. And many nights you're working three or four gigs in one night, you yeah. know, mm-hmm. back in the day. Now, you mentioned Nick's. We've heard a lot of stories about Nick's in certain time frames. Was uh, I think Harrison is the one that told us that he said there were times that was like being in the Thunderdome. You yeah, were fighting for your room. life because that was a tough, tough yeah. room at times. And I've I've only done Nick's, obviously. I started in, in 2002, so I started much, much later than you guys um you know and i did nicks a few times but it was just a regular comedy room you know at this point right. so did you experience any of that when you were at nicks those really oh, tough yeah. crowds and oh absolutely yeah they they would let you know instantly if yep. they if you were taking too long to get to the punch and i, <laughs> yeah. I was there that, that big night um when gavin got attacked oh really like, like physically attacked 
Oh, you don't know about this? No, I no, never heard about never this heard one. The story. Uh, during my, um, I was doing open mics. It was probably 1989, I'm guessing. Yeah, it had to be 1989 or 19, late 1988. And it was an open mic and Gav came in just to, you know, do some time. Mm-hmm. And uh, he was going back and forth. There was some guy in the crowd from Charlestown, some big group from Charlestown who had given him a hard time. And Gav just destroyed him, just made him into total asshole. You know? mm-hmm. And the last thing Gav said was, uh, hey, so you're, you're a movie star. I didn't know you were a movie star. Hey, uh, have you guys seen Rain Man? You know, that was, that was big at the time. Rain Man was out. Right. And this guy was a huge guy. And he stood up and he just ran. He tackled Gav. And, no. uh, oh yeah. And chairs started flying. It was like the wild west. I mean, <laughs> the whole place oh, turned into a rumble. I mean, it, there was blood everywhere. It was awful. Oh Jeez. my God. Cops with their guns out running by. It was crazy. Oh my the God. Whole place I never heard out. that. It was all over the newspapers too. No. no. It grew who had next. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah I, I didn't, I didn't get hit that time. Um, <laughs> that time, I look. Said, was Nick's a tough room? Well, Gavin got got, got Gavin, attacked. Gavin, I didn't get hit. That Gavin time. got in a bloody brawl. For, I didn't get hit yeah. that time. Four other nights, <laughs> though. Let me tell you, I never actually got hit. I came close to getting hit several times. Yep. Um, there was a time in Vermont, believe it or not, I got. Uh, I was doing Vermont a of all places. Yeah, it was a place called Christopher's in Vermont. Yeah. And I was doing my thing, and there was this shithead guy in the front row, just drunk as hell, and going back and forth to the point where they finally kick him out and because he just was slurring all over the place. And at the end of the show, me and some waitresses and the bouncer and some other, the other comics, we go outside, we can find some place to eat. And this guy walks up to me and he just doesn't realize I'm the guy. Like he doesn't know I'm the, the <laughs> Yep. And he's complaining about me to me. And so I'm just oh, like, how about that asshole comic? <laughs> yeah, and he's he's going up, and, and then he realizes he goes, "Wait, you're 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 him, you're him." And I'm oh. like, "Yeah, man, I'm him." And he pulls his hand back to punch me, and the bouncer's right there. The bouncer grabbed him, threw him down, and uh, Scott, you don't like blood, right? So should I be careful with this? I don't want to. No, you know, yeah. have, right, attached to the club, there was a, there was an upstairs, and there were these stone stone steps going up with like space between yep. and he threw the guy down and he got his head wedged in between the steps and he started <laughs> kicking the guy's head further between the steps. And I was like, Holy shit. He, oh we were all God. like, okay, okay. Well, he's done. He's done. That was oh probably the closest God. I came to getting hit, but luckily never hit. Wow. No, I, yeah, I'm I'm rough. okay with blood. It's floating apparitions and, and yeah, spirits not, and ghosts, it's ghosts and that I would like rather that. avoid that is, uh, if possible. Yeah. I've only had one time and I hadn't even engaged the crowd or anything yet. I, I walked up on stage mm-hmm. and I, I literally said um, an opening line to my first joke. I said, you ever have your kids walk in on you when you're having sex? And this drunk guy stands up at the front table and he goes, well, hey, what if that was my kid that walked in on you? And I'm like, the whole crowd is like, what? <laughs> it like made no sense. And right? I just said, well, don't let them sleep. Let your kids sleep over my house. And he <laughs> Starts running to to charge the stage, but he's so drunk he can't even run. He's like falling over himself and everything like this. And I I just look at the crowd. I go, this might take a while. <laughs> and he's like falling over people and tripping and everything. And before he got halfway to the stage, the bouncers got him and they're dragging him out. But you know, the whole room is uncomfortable now, and you got to yeah, kind of deal yeah, with this yeah. and bring it back. But it was just such a weird moment. I'm like, what? And then I'm thinking to myself afterwards, what if he actually got to the stage? I don't think it would have been much of a fight because he could barely stand up or anything but you know how would i have handled that had he got to the stage and tried to grab me or anything i probably would have i i had grabbed the mic stand and had that in my hand just in case to kind of push him away or something like that i would have pretended to be a lion tamer or something you know just tried to make a joke out of it but it was so weird that you know that this was happening but i can imagine in that case you know they're beating his head into a stone <laughs> step <Stone> step <laughs> you know can't we all just get along man <laughs> but remember those but remember those days when places actually had bouncers oh because <laughs> now right. nothing you know right. they just fucking stare at you like well, well uh, what are you gonna do 
Oh, yeah. I, I've had places now tell you, yeah, if, if a heckler gets out of hand, just ignore them until they stop. No, why don't you police no. the room and yeah, throw them out? Job. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. We've had man if managers tell us, yeah, if they get out of hand, just ignore them until it stops. He's not a three-year-old throwing a fit in a toy store. Mm. <laughs> you know what I mean? This could get out of hand. Yeah. How about you do your job and police the room and get rid of them if it's right. that bad? Yeah. It's ridiculous. <laughs> so... Sorry. I no, that's okay. I, 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 I was venting. Yeah, I noticed. I noticed. <laughs> I, I was venting. I want to kind of get you out of your headspace there. Uh, <laughs> no. So then you said in 94, you moved out of Boston. Now, that was was that before like the mass exodus of the Bill Burrs and the, and the Patrice O'Neills and, and, you know, uh, uh, Dane no. Cook? No, it was. Dane um, was after 94. Was it? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I was one of the first. The only okay. one who went before me was uh, Patty Ross. Oh, okay. Yep. Patty I, don't, I shouldn't say one of the first. I mean, Lenny was out there 10 years before. Oh, that. yeah. Lenny was out there. Billy Martin had gone out there yeah. uh, by then, right? So Yeah, so it was 90, 94. I went out and... Um, what made just, you do it? Like, you wanted to make yeah, the big move to get a because sitcom? That's, that's or, like six years in. So, you know, yeah. that's, that's a pretty well, quick I was, move. I was doing well. I, yep. you know, stopped bombing i stopped having bad sets i was uh -huh. doing great all the time and i thought you know i was looking at my date book and it was just the same gigs over and over again yeah yeah, yeah. nick stitches comedy connection pure platinum you know right. charlie horse all these over, yeah. over and over and over again i'm like i i don't want to spend the rest of my life doing all these just same thing i mean why don't i right. take a shot and those so last I, two sounded like strip clubs, by the way. Pure Platinum and Charlie Horse. Yeah. <laughs> Charlie Just Horse. Saying. Yeah, but Charlie Horse, was that the Chance Langton room in Bridgewater or something? Or I think there are a few. I think I think it was in Kingston. Oh, okay. Shut like, up. Mark Shut up. <laughs> I think why not take a shot while I'm young, you know? Yeah. 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 And everybody was getting sitcom deals at that time. Right. That was like the prime time of of, you know, people going out. Yeah. Doing their act and then going, yeah, we can build a show around that. Yeah. So right. I packed up my Nissan Pulsar and I drove out there. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and uh, had to start all over because I didn't have any representation yeah. or anything. So I had to stand in line at the Laugh Factory. Oh. And that was really, really kind of degrading. You know, those people show up at like seven in the morning. Yeah. And they take the first 20. Oh. And uh, I did that. And you get three minutes, and I went on, and uh, three and really minutes, pissed. three minutes, and I was pissed because the guy who uh, you know on the club, Jamie Masada, yeah, you know, I was looking at this as an audition for him, and he wasn't even there. Right. I was so pissed, I just ranted the whole time I was up there, but it ended up it killed. Yep. And there was a guy in the audience who was with a management company, and they called me the next day, and they wanted to. Uh, represent me so i kind of lucked out in that sense mm -hmm. and i became a regular at the factory really quickly wow. um so that was great and then you know it was other but it was really hard getting used to no stage time because even being in at a club you know 20 minutes here and there is nothing like what i was used to of going right on right multiple times a night right so it was really like starting all over again and and after doing, you know, like you said, you were closing the outskirts rooms, closing some of the Boston downtown rooms. It's a it's a tough adjustment when all of a sudden someone goes, yeah, you got three to five minutes. And oh. you're like, I don't even know what the fuck to do for three I, to five minutes. I'm used to doing 45. And that's why I you said know? when you said three minutes, I had to repeat it because I'm thinking yeah, to myself, what one joke do how I do you do? get up there, establish yourself to the crowd and make them laugh in a three minute time period? It's tough. Oh, you know, takes it takes 10 minutes to say hello yeah right. exactly exactly so to to condense all this into a three minute version i guess it's no different than comics nowadays that go on america's got talent and, and you 90 get seconds. 90 seconds yeah. for your first audition and yeah. you're just thinking how many laughs can i squeeze into this 90 seconds right i i guess it's the same concept so because we never worked together was your act about like your life was it sitcom material like, no. was there no <laughs> no no I, i'm a dick joke guy always been a dick joke guy yeah. robbie robbie always busts my balls he goes can you write one bit without a blowjob in it can you just <laughs> like, awesome. no matter what the topic is i can find a way to get a blowjob into that joke <laughs> it's a curse i'm not happy about it you know especially well, after i had kids 
<laughs> right. Well, with all due re- and with all due respect too, your first gig was with Larry Rapucci. That was your mentor. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> right? Hello. Come on. Exactly. <laughs> That's so funny. So no, how I, long? I, I'm sorry. Go go, no, no, no. Go ahead. I say I, I try to clean it up. You know? Yeah. I, I try to come up with my TV time and all that. Um, but it just, it, you know, I, and I got, I got a bunch of auditions and I, I landed a few things. Um, my act was mostly about, you know, trying to score girls. Yeah, I, I was more of a storyteller than a, mm-hmm. than a bit writer. Yeah. Right. Yep. Um, I got some, I got some stuff. I got, uh, I lucked into, um, some warm up work. I, yep. so I, do, I did warm up for the MTV show singled out for a couple seasons. Yep. And I did married with children and, oh, cool. um, yeah, that was really cool. And th- that uh, that led into like a, I got a guest spot. They put me on camera for one episode. So that yeah. was just amazing. And looking back, you know, we all do this when we get older. I'm just like, man, I had so many chances. I could have done so many different things. Yeah, why didn't I parlay that one yeah. gig on Married with Children into something more? Why didn't right. I like, like the, take the, that route, you know? The camera guys would tell me, man, the producers love you. They think you're so funny. That Never did I think of writing a spec script to give to them or right, anything right. like that. Just stupid, stupid. Yeah. <laughs> Did you do any acting while you were out there? Like, did you take acting classes or go oh, for yeah. commercials yeah. or anything like that? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. I took acting classes. Robbie and I did it together. I did uh, after he moved out. But I took classes with a guy named Aaron Spicer. J-Lo was in my acting class. Re- <clears throat> really? Yeah. Yeah, she, wow. was, she wasn't She was famous at the time. She'd maybe done one or two things. And, uh, Is this yeah, before in, my- in Living Color? Before she was a fly, I think fly it was, girl. It was after In Living Color, but before Money Train. Okay. <clears throat> um, wow. She was really cool. She was down yeah. there. Um, yeah, I, got, I did a couple things. I did a, there was a, a movie that I did where I played a, a rodeo clown that was kind really? of fun. Yeah, yeah. Was, uh, yeah, I did some acting, but nothing, you know, no star studded breaks. I did some guest appearances on the Singled Out show, like doing characters for the questions. Yeah. Things like that. So how long were you out there for? 20 years. Wow. So I got there. Yeah, I got there. Wait, 20 years. 94 to 2000. Yeah, I got there in 94. And I left in um, 2013. Yeah, so just over 20 years. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Wow. I got there three days before the earthquake. Really? Yeah. That was like a welcome. And you stayed for 20 years? I would have been like, I'm out. (laughs) This is a sign from God. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) (laughs) Holy shit. Yeah, that was terrifying. I didn't know what was going on. And so what made you go to now? Did you go right from LA to Atlanta? No. I um I was single for a few years and then I started going out with a girl named Dana, who was the manager of the Laugh Factory. Yep. And um, because her, the Jamie, the owner, started managing me uh-huh. and uh, he took me on as a client and he would like send me out on stuff and have people come. And mm-hmm. so Dana and I, we, we got close and we were buddies for a long time. And then we started to go. We hooked up and we started going out. Yep. And it was really funny because well, she hates when I tell this story. But before, <laughs> before I moved out, a year before I moved out, my sister saw a misprint in in the paper where I think Delta or one of the airlines had a round trip from Boston to LA for 60 bucks. Yeah. And uh, she bought a couple of wow. tickets. So we went out and uh, while I was there, I went to all the clubs to check out the scene because I was thinking about going. And when we went to the laugh factory, uh, we walked in and Dana was hosting and managing. Mm-hmm. And uh, she said, Oh, come on in. I, 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 I talked my way and I said, I didn't want to buy a ticket. I said, Hey, I'm a comic from Boston. And, thinking about moving here. We just want to check it out. She said, Oh yeah, come on in y'all. She's a Southern girl from Atlanta. And yep. he went to see that. Well, can you not set us up front? Because they're probably not going to stay. I don't want to interrupt the show. And she's like, Oh, okay. So I liked it. And as we were leaving, she said, um, she goes, you know, you don't seem like you're from Boston. I thought everybody from Boston was a jerk. And I said, what are you basing Ooh, that on? That's nice not a pickup line. Record. And she goes, well, and you know what, when here's my number, when you get ready to move out, call me and uh, maybe I can set up a showcase for you, help you out. And I said, Oh my God, that would be so great. And year goes by, six months goes by, and I'm putting the plan into motion. And I call her, and she gets on the phone. Hello, this is Dana. And I said, Hey, Dana, this is uh, Todd Parker. I met you about six months ago. I was out there with my sister, and she's like, uh, Yeah, yeah, and and I was like, and I, uh, <laughs> She was in manager mode. She oh, had no time for your bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> she was in 
full manager mode, like sitting yeah. on like a hundred tapes from all over the country. Oh, yeah. yeah, exactly. And uh, the fuck do I, you I, want? <laughs> right. Yeah. And I said, you uh, I'm from Boston. You made a joke about you thought everybody from Boston was a jerk. And she goes, uh, now, look, look, I'm sorry. I don't remember you. I don't have time to talk right now. And I go, well, you said, she goes, look, just, just send me a tape. Okay. Thanks. Bye. Oh, and, you know, like, oh wow. Damn it. So then I'm like, going to get back at her. I'm going to marry that bitch. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to ruin her I'm life. I'm going to ruin her life. <laughs> it's still paying for it. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't tell her. I didn't remind her about it when, after I got there. There was yeah. no, you look familiar, none of that stuff. And then after we started going out, I still never said anything. And it wasn't until we got more serious that I reminded her oh. at an opportune time. And she was like, <laughs> What, wait, what? And I said, "Uh huh." You still want that tape? And she's like, wait. <laughs> "And uh, and we." And she she laughed when she was very apologetic. Oh my god, I can't believe I did that. I'm so sorry. And I was, like, ah, I don't remember. She was under the stress of being a manager. I mean, that's <laughs> yeah. again, I get it. It's so funny because. They all do it. <laughs> well, it, even just booking comedy, like we've talked oh, about it before. It's like. I always used to be like, God, why are bookers such assholes? I know. And then all of a sudden you start booking. Like, I only book one show. It's literally one show that I'll do like three or four times a year. And mm -hmm. I I just posted something. I did. I, I hadn't done it for about four years. I wanted to bring it back. I did it in October. And I just posted the other day. I said, hey, want to bring Ace Aceto's Royal Flush show back? Thinking about doing another one. Who's in? Meaning audience members. Like, who the fuck wants to come to this show if I do it? Right. Every goddamn comic in New England was like, I'm in, I'm in, yeah. I'm in. It's like, oh, my God. No wonder fucking bookers hate everyone. Right. I get it now. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's, it's, really it's the really old bad. joke, and, and we do it all the time on here when someone's telling us about, you know, the, the, shittiest gig. the shitty gig or where they bombed at, and we go, who books that? Yeah, yeah, Because yeah, you know. we don't care. We just want we just want to do it. Right. You know, but, uh, you know, I, ha I have a show that I book three or four times a year at this theater, and the last one that I had, I, I do four comics on it, four headliners. Mm -hmm. And I had one spot that the first person I had, like a month before the show, I'm like, all right, everybody, you know, send me a headshots for the poster and everything. And this person wasn't responding. Mm -hmm. And I finally tracked them down and they were like, oh yeah, I thought I'd contact you. I can't do it. <sighs> um, I got an emergency, I can't do it. And I'm like, oh, well, it should happen, so I understand. So I reach out to another person and they're like, yeah, I, I, uh, you know, I'd love to do it. They send me the headshot, stuff like that. A week later, they reach out. Yeah, I'm sorry. I didn't realize. Um, I actually double booked that night. I can't do it. Dude. I did, five people I went through till I locked somebody in wow. a week and a half before the show. I booked this thing and six, these are seven, eight months in advance. Right. And these are all headliners. And I was like, I said to him, I'm done. I'm going to turn this over to somebody else. I've been doing it for eight years now. Mm -hmm. I've had it with these people. <laughs> You know, I, I and, just, you know what it is? I think because, you know, it's funny because some guys used to make fun of me for having a day job. I worked, you know, I got in with yeah. a pharmaceutical company in 97. And I remember, I don't know, you were probably gone by then. The Grill 93 in Andover, was oh, that running? Yeah. So uh, Ronnie, the, the manager there, used to bust my balls and say, yeah, well, Ace, you're not a real comic because, you, you know, you, you have a day job. And I'm like, yeah, I'm also responsible. I'm not going to flake out on a gig or I'm not going to double book. 33 years, I have never double booked myself on a night ever i don't think I ever i've had, had the these fucking guys that are in for like six years who are like oh i totally forgot i was doing this other gig and i know for a fact they're making less money at the other gig. I, you know what and honestly kills me. Kills I, me. I truly but not to get off on a tangent I which know, we somehow, do <laughs> somehow this is becoming todd if you want to sit there with a with a notepad and and d take our therapy session down i feel don't free. i don't believe most of the time these people have double booked I think they come. There's another gig that was offered, and they would want to do that gig, and they, they don't want to just say, "Hey, listen, I want to go do this other gig." Right. They use that as the bullshit excuse to get mm -hmm. out of yours, so they could go do that one. Probably. Although the accidents, I've never double booked myself. Yeah. But I can exactly. see, see how it could happen. 
you know, but uh, I, I've never I've never done it myself. I mean, you guys no. both started, you know, before all the cell phone shit and everything like I do. And you hand wrote in a planner. Yeah. Just like I yeah, did when I started. And I didn't double book then. And I still handwrite it in, in something now. And I still don't mm-hmm. double book. So right. I'm sorry. I have trouble with that one, too. I'm like ace. That, that's ah, I have, And there's a couple of people that have done it to both of us on separate occasions. And we're like comparing notes, and I'm like, yeah, they, this is when they did it to me. Oh, yeah, that's when they. I did got it one to guy me. that yeah. did it to me twice. Yeah. Oh, see, there's yeah. no, there's no reason for that. I mean, exactly. if they do it multiple times, then that's bullshit. Yeah. And that's yeah, exactly. Thing. And one of the guys has done it to me twice, and him twice. And I'm like, nice guy. I like him. I think he's funny, but I'll never book him. I'll be on a show with him, and I'll I'll be cordial right. and nice. But I'll never book him again. I need someone I could depend on. And I'm not talking know? about a. I had a situation where I had someone booked on the show, and two weeks before the show, they contacted me. They said, "Listen, um, I got to go out to the West Coast. I just got offered this writing gig, uh, you know, yeah. on a TV show, and I got to fly out there to do some writing. Um, you know, it's just one of those things. I didn't know this was going to pop up. I apologize. I get that. You yeah, know, that. Makes that sense. And this person even said to me, hey, but I checked with a couple other people. These people are free if you want to have any of them on the show. I yeah. just, you know, they even. Yeah, exactly. That's yeah, they that, found a replacement. That's being professional. That's that I don't have a problem with. But just right. saying, oh, I double booked and I, I book with them first. So I can't do yours. I, I, I have trouble with that one. But but yeah. getting back to the, the situation that that she was in when you were a manager back then, like you said, your office was filled with thousands of VCR tapes yeah. That you had to sit through. Press kits. Press your, kits. Your, your yeah. media kits, mm-hmm. your press kits, your headshot, your resume, your VCR tape yeah. <laughs> that you'd ship out. Your lithograph from ABC so there's, uh, photos. There's, there's a question we can't ask too often. Todd, yeah, right. how many of those kits did you mail out over the years? Yeah, right. <laughs> how many did I mail out? Yeah. yeah. How many did you send out to bookers over the years of the, your uh, videotapes with your, uh, your resume bio. and your bio and all that shit over the years? Uh, you know what? Probably less than ten. Really? Really? Yeah. Probably less than ten. Because you were always just able to get up on stage. Yeah, it was during the boom. I, you know, right. I, That's I, true the too. Only, I I tried to uh, I tried to work in St. Louis. I sent some stuff to St. Louis because I had relatives in St. Louis. Mm-hmm. And uh, no, that was pretty much it. I, I, you know, I ended up working in New York through some people. You know, that they'd come into town and work. Yep. And you'd, Change contacts and put in a word for you. Yeah, yeah. recommendation. Yeah, That's true. yeah, yeah. But um, no, I didn't send out a whole lot of tapes. <laughs> so not that to, must just be me then. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> not okay, to whatever. Not podcast to, over. Well, not to give it away. <laughs> Not to give it away, but you you did kind of mention that you know nice Southern girl from Atlanta, and then you said earlier that you're in Atlanta. So yes. uh, what made you move to Atlanta? Well, we we got serious, and um, you know. I just got to a point where well, we were getting married and I had to decide whether or not I wanted, because I knew a lot of these, you know, I'm not knocking anybody, but, you know, we all meet these old comics who that's all they do. You know, they never got married. Mm-hmm. No. They're just old now. And they're like in their seventies and, and yeah. there are plenty of, there are also guys like that who are happy as clams. Right. And love it. But I, I always wanted to have a family and I didn't see, how I could do that Out doing there. what I was doing. Right. So right. I, just, I made a conscious decision, like, you know what, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to try and I'm going to get a day job mm-hmm. and s- s- try that and then do comedy on the side. Yep. So I, I did, I got a job teaching art okay. at a school in LA and I just, I still did the, uh, you know, the occasional uh, audition and I still work now and then, but it got more and more frequent Mm-hmm. Less less frequent, I'm sorry. And then I had kids, and that made it, you know, that much changes. Less yeah. And we would come. She was from Atlanta, so I'd go back to Atlanta her a few times. And then when we had kids, she had a bunch of relatives back here, and it was just really wonderful watching our kids play with all the nieces and nephews. Cousins, I mean, it's just, yeah, yeah, it was just <clears throat> unbelievable. It was just like, wow, you can't do that in L.A. Like in L.A., you know, we have plenty of friends, but no family, right? And, we just said, you know what? Let's uh, after ten years or so, we just said, let's let's do it. Let's just move to Atlanta, and yeah. everything's so cheap here compared to L.A. I mean, oh, compared to L.A., yeah. How we so well, in L.A. was, and it, it, and it had to be easier for you too, 
being from Boston, you probably have family up in, do you still have family up in Boston? Up I do. In my brother's in Boston, my dad and my sister are in Florida. Okay. So, yeah. So now at least you're all on the East coast, right? Yeah. This is the meeting point. Usually they come here and we have a fun time. Yeah. And I still, you know, for a long time, I would, I would make sure at least twice a year, I'd go back and play Boston, you know, yeah. do the yep. that kind of thing. That's awesome. Yeah. That's so cool. As uh, the every time someone mentions a Kowloon, I just think of Frank Santarelli when he he goes the Chinese ski chalet <laughs> up on the hill. What's wrong with you people? What's wrong with you people? I'm staying in the motel next door. They have free HBO phone calls from your room. From your room. <laughs> Frank's hilarious. Oh my oh, god, love Frank. Well, I don't know if you listen to our opening montage, but he's the one that says, "Hey." How about a hand for Ace Aceto and Scott Higgins? Both of them coked up out of their minds. <laughs> in the middle, literally, we were in the middle of talking to him on the podcast like three years ago, four years ago, and that he just came out with that, and we're like, that's gold. We're, we're saving that clip. <laughs> Frank. So now, uh, so you've been down, it, down there now almost 10 years, right? 2013? Yeah. 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 And, and you've been teaching art. You still oh, doing no, no, comedy? No, not, any, not anymore. I, I'm sorry. Oh, no. Oh, I didn't even get to the. Oh, I skipped me, ahead. No, go ahead. I, no, I, I blew right past it. I'm sorry. So I was teaching art for like four years or so. Mm -hmm. And once the kids were born, I've always been involved with cameras. I've always had cameras, video cameras, cameras. I just love cameras. Mm -hmm. And um, I used to make little movies and I just always loved it. And when my kids were born, I was I used to make these little videos of them. And the, the school that I taught at was a Jewish day school. Mm -hmm. And they, you know, I don't know if either of you have ever been to a bar mitzvah. Yep. I've so, never been, but I know how I've been, they yeah, been yeah. to several. Yeah. So at these bar mitzvahs, they, uh, they play a video montage, like a retrospective of the kid's life up until yep. age 12, basically. Mm -hmm. So I was working on a video of my daughter in the classroom in between classes. You know, I was like the cool art teacher, like in between classes, kids would come and hang out. And hang out with you. And yep. Me getting arrested. I can say that, you know, back then. <laughs> yeah. And um, one of them said, oh, you should do my brother's montage. And I, was, I said, what's that? And they explained it to me. And I said, oh, yeah, I could do that. So I did one for that kid's party. Mm -hmm. And that led off to a bunch of referrals. And the, the school was kind of a high-end school, like Beverly yeah. Hills. Hotel, yep. I'm at school. And um, before I knew it, I, I didn't need the art teacher job because I was just selling these videos. Wow. And I just... Yeah, I was doing that for a living then. I was doing okay and video production. Yeah, yeah so specific that specific niche though, just doing all those montages. It started, did it, it branch that, out? Yeah. It started with that and then I branched into doing corporate stuff here and there. But um I was able to work my other um loves into it. Like I, I wasn't just doing montages that were you know, pictures and music. Mm -hmm. I was doing, you know, I was filming comedy segments with the kids. I was writing scripts and right. doing like movie spoofs and TV spoofs. And because I had, I could tell what was funny and what wasn't funny. Like most of right. these yeah. were really funny. So like when they were playing, you know, normally when a montage plays, I don't mean to toot my own horn, but you know, oh. there's like some laughs here and there. Oh, there's the kid in an early Halloween costume. Ah, you know what I right. mean? I had like written bits that these kids were acting out and. <laughs> so I was, yeah, it was like watching a show for like 12 minutes you put right. an actual production value yeah. into the video right yeah and then the more i did it the more i just kept up in my game and learning more and you know improving my equipment improving my style and then i started doing that with some businesses as well like using that as, as a marketing tool mm -hmm. like making videos that were funny and not just you know where you have this sale next week that is you know right fun stuff so when we moved I was able to do that wherever we were. Like I had to start all over again, building up my clientele in Atlanta, but I did. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, that's what I'm still doing now. I make these videos for all kinds of different purposes. Wow. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, it's awesome that you get to do what you're passionate about, first of all, but it's also awesome that you've gotten to do a bunch of different things that are your passion. And it's funny because people are always asking me like, how do you, when do you sleep? You know, we do the podcast. I do comedy. I work for a medical company. I, you know, uh, I just wrote a book, a kid's book we were talking about earlier. I'm like, you know what? I don't want to die and regret that. I never tried these things. I want, 
I want to be a master of, you know, a, a jack of all trades, master of none. I want to be right. able to say I've done all these little different things. So it's great when you, especially when you're an artist, when you have this artistic thing in you, mm. you want to express yourself and you don't want, most artists don't just do one thing. They want to do multiple things, right? Yeah. You want to express right. art in different ways. My 19 year old is very artistic has taken a couple of photography classes. My ex and I bought her a glass blowing class last year for Christmas. She loved it. So I told her, I'll get you a couple of more. Like she wants to learn how to express herself in all these different ways. And I, I'm more than, you know, more than supportive because I know what it feels like to be that artistic person mm -hmm. that wants to express themselves. You know, right. Yeah. So that's awesome. We've gotten to do so many different things. And that's kind of a perfect segue into the latest thing that you did. Yeah. Which, again, we talk about behind the funny. And I was wondering how you were going to get there, but you always find a way. I find a way. You always you find know, a way. You know, yeah, you guys find are pretty a way. good at this. Thanks, yeah. man. Yeah. Sure. So, uh, so how did you decide? I mean, obviously, if you're artistic, you know, writing a book is, okay. is kind of a, a natural path. It's another way of expression, but you didn't do a funny book. Yeah, I was going to say, it was, <laughs> wasn't humor writing. It, it, was, it, you, it ties more into Scott Tober, so. Uh, oh, <laughs> time for my bathroom break. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I had, um, well, over the years, I'd written, you know, I'd written some screenplays. I'd written some scripts. Um, nothing ever got made. Like, a couple things went into development. And came close, but didn't make it all the way. Yeah. And uh, I just, I just loved the whole process of writing. I love creating characters on the page. I loved all that stuff. And uh, I got this idea for this story. Um, my kids actually, they were real little at the time. We were walking down the street, and and we were planning on going to the zoo. And my son was excited to see the werewolves at the zoo because I'm, a, I'm a huge horror fan. I've yep. always been a horror fan. I grew up on horror movies and creature double feature and comic books and all that stuff. I just love it. And um, so I was that dad who would pass all that stuff on to my kids and teach him all the stuff I shouldn't have taught them <laughs> at that age. <laughs> I fully expected to see werewolves at the zoo. And I had to let him down and tell him, no, that's not going to, he goes, well, the, the, why not? There should be a zoo with werewolves. And it just stuck in my head. The idea of a zoo with, I'm, I'm just know. looking up the number to DCF in Atlanta. <laughs> Give me a second. <laughs> Let him tell his story. <laughs> it's fine. It's fine. It's true. No, I'm so I, I played around with the idea a little. At first, I started to write it as a screenplay. Mm -hmm. And I found I didn't, you know, screenplays are a real tough nut. Like, you, there's not a lot of room for prose. You know, it's mostly just walks into the room, sees this person, you know, mm -hmm. laugh, doesn't laugh. I wanted to really put some descriptions in there and. Mm -hmm. so I started writing it as a book years ago, like 10 years ago, I started it and I would walk away from it. I'd write like 20 pages and walk away and then walk back to it and redo those 20 pages. And I must've done that countless times, just redoing yeah. it the first 20 pages over and over again. And then uh, maybe a year before COVID, I got real serious with it and started putting every, every weekend from like six to noon, Saturday and Sunday, like that's all I did. I just worked on that book. And and then certain weekdays I would do it as well until I got it done. And I finished it just about the time that COVID was kicking in. So then I spent that whole year of COVID polishing it up and mm -hmm. you know, sending it to people as a manuscript, you know, the rough edges and and um finally got it to a point where I think I think I can show this to real people now. And and then I hired, I showed it to some people. Do you guys remember um Erica Fernick. Why does that name sound familiar? She was a comic. Erica. And um, she she's tall, blonde. I know she's that really name. Funny. And she I was know. like, um, she was on the scene for a while. Well, she she wrote a book. She wrote a few books, and then she wrote a book that Oprah put on her list. And oh uh, wow, yeah, and just it was called um, the River at Night, and it just like blew so up like, once crazy. Oprah, yeah. And she got like a book deal and she's made some movie deals now and stuff. And, and I called her to get her opinion and she was like really sweet. She was great. She was like, you know, she read my, my manuscript and she gave me some pointers and told me what I needed to work on and what didn't mm -hmm. work. And, you know, just like a comic, you know, total honesty. Right. Yeah. Right. Yep. Like, 
And I'm like, oh, it's great. It's good. Good luck. Yeah, not mints and words. Like, yeah. Because you know, it, it's, it's really going to help you. So, yeah, exactly. And she said, you really need an editor. Like, you definitely need an editor. So I, I you know, I, um, I sprung for the editor and uh, hired somebody, like, who was really um, well-reviewed. And, and she did a great job. And that whole process was just fascinating, like, going mm-hmm. back and forth with this editor about certain things. And, and prove, showing things that I did wrong that I never would have considered. Dumb things, like you know, saying Neptune was the Greek god of this when Poseidon was the Greek god. Oh, Neptune, right. God, you know, <laughs> stuff like that. And um, she really got it to a different place. And I felt, oh, this is this is really good. So then I started sending it to more people and thought, you know what? After going the publisher route, I'm going to self-publish. And that's how it went. And so far, I'm getting a lot of good reviews. Nobody's told me flat out that it sucked yet. So yeah. that's no, when I looked at the bio and and talk, you know, I saw the book, it's gotten great reviews. Um, I don't know which one it was that I read, but I mean, it was it was all positive. It was it was great. Um, so yeah, so it's called those reviews are even real. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, just because it's from your sister doesn't mean it's not real. OK, no, I think uh, I think the first four were uh, friends. OK. And yeah, then we all yeah, need that. And then I started getting some real ones. Yeah. And I started, uh, you know, kind of like not pr- promoting those other ones. Um, I just got back. Do you guys know what Kirkus Reviews is? Mm, uh, that's the one that I read. Yeah. So you post uh, about it. That's like a legit review, right? Yeah, that's a real one. They, they've been around for almost 100 years. They're like, if you go into the bookstore, go to Barnes & Noble and look at every third book, and then it'll say on the back, Kirkus Reviews says this. Right. So you, basically, you pay them. And they'll review your book, but they don't guarantee that it's going to be good. Like that, it's going to be a good review, right? Yeah, like they'll they'll hit you back because I I did a lot of research on them, and you know online there's a lot of people who are pissed off because they paid this money and they got a review back, and, <laughs> and then you got you know, a shit review the shit out of the book. So it was a big gamble. <laughs> like I didn't know which way it was going to go. I was terrified <clears> because at the time, you know, it took like nine weeks for them to do the review, and it's like because I'm only hearing from friends, and you don't know what. See, that's the thing that sucks with comedy. You can go on stage and know you you're doing well. Right. Get up and you hear the laughs. And, you know, when I make right. a video, I can hear the crowd responding to the video. I know that. Right. With this, I had no clue. Right. I was like, this could totally suck and I'm going to make a fool out of myself. And I just had no idea. You're not getting that instant feedback that you right. used to. Yeah. Right. So when the Kirkus review came in, very positive, I was like, oh, thank God. Okay. So now I, I don't have to be afraid. If, like, if, if I get that, I know. Sure. I'm sure people are. There are going to be people who don't like it. Of course. Of I'm course. Afraid. Yeah. But I know we, we just I think we told you the guy that came up with this, uh, uh, you know, live from the basement. Mm-hmm. He just actually wrote he co-wrote uh, the official Seinfeld cookbook that was just released. And we, you know, of course, uh, we're friends with him. So I had to make him squirm a little bit. I go, have you read the reviews? And he goes, no, I don't care. I go, well, let's pull some up and read. Them. <laughs> and <laughs> and the oh, funny yeah. Thing, the funny thing is, it just shows the stupidity of the the stupidity of the general public. Like, mm-hmm. at some point, you're like, I don't even care that that's a bad review because they must be an idiot. Like, <laughs> the only bad reviews it got, it, it got like two bad reviews, and it wasn't even bad. They I, were all four and five stars. Yeah. But the mm-hmm. four stars, the complaint was that the print was too small. Had nothing to do with the the recipes. It had nothing to do with like I made this and it sucked, or it, it had nothing to do with him. It had to right. do with the friggin' printing that was the you know <laughs> the editor or the the designer of the book. It's like just so stupid. Who's there gonna pick out on what? Morons, just total morons. Right. My, yeah. my, wife, my wife works for a company called um, Equity Estates, and they had it's. They basically own a bunch of high-end luxury homes around the world, and then people can buy into these homes and stay there. Like they get certain dates throughout the year, so it's like your home that you're staying at, basically. Yep. And there was, I, I wonder if I'm going to get in trouble. To, nah, it doesn't matter. So there was one client <laughs> who stayed in one of these beachfront homes and then complained that they couldn't sleep at night because the ocean was too loud. Like literally <laughs> complaining that the waves were keeping them up. It's like seriously, yeah. wow. It's how like, is seriously? That, like, how does this person exist? Right. I, how do you honestly put that as a review? Yeah. I, I, I don't get it. So let, let me ask you this. If I'm picking up your book yes. and I, you know, I'm in the bookstore, I pick it up. 
billionaire boogeyman. I wanted to okay. get the title out billionaire, there. And I open it up and I'm reading the inside flap to get an idea of what the book's all about. Mm-hmm. What does it say? Give us a. Uh, I can just read he's it. He's going to you read it. Want. He's got it with him. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. When homicide detective Vic Mitchum's fiance, Kelsey Moss, vanishes while working undercover as a prostitute, the only clue to her disappearance is a paranormal investigator's crazy claim that an elite clandestine society operating a secret museum has been abducting women off the streets of Boston for decades. Forced to bury his skepticism, Mitchum races against the clock as his search pulls him into a web of billionaire moguls, mysterious deaths, political cover-ups, and shadow assassins. In this nightmarish world, his lifelong beliefs are turned upside down as he faces dangers he never imagined possible, and only days remain, maybe hours, before Kelsey suffers a horrifying fate. And then in big letters it says, monsters exist, there is life after death, and mankind is not alone in the universe. All right, who's playing Mitchum in the movie? (laughs) This is what I want to know. (laughs) I, I, you know, I play around with that. I'd like, uh, I'd like Kyle Chandler, the guy who from Friday Night Lights. I love Kyle Chandler. Love he has him. like this great because the I tried to make the book kind of realistic. Um, I mean, how can you make something realistic with these type of things? But I did right. my best to base it in some kind of reality. And he always strikes me as somebody who would scoff at anything well, paranormal. Well, look at right. his. Did you ever see the show Bloodline? Oh, on I love Netflix. It. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. His, his character in that would be very similar exactly, to exactly. Mitchum. Yes. Yeah. 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 All right. Good call. Good Here's call. Here's the thing, because you said your your daughter helps with TikTok videos and stuff. Yeah. Is she good at meta tags for uh, for like the internet and stuff? Uh, <laughs> like I, the I, three I, of us understand meta tags. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I, I don't know what a meta tag is. Well, I'm the sorry. only reason why I say meta tags is because when I do a Google search of billionaire boogeyman. Everything, oh, boogeyman. Do you want to know what's funny? You know what comes up for billionaire boogeyman? Even what? when I put book after it, every fucking article is on George Soros. <laughs> <laughs> the difference one letter makes. Wow. Holy wow. shit. <laughs> Maybe somehow that's what this book is all about. Okay, this one came up. Yeah, that, that came up. It's something, there are George Soros characters who are, it's kind of a double meaning. It's similar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, the pharmaceutical heads and the tobacco heads, all those yeah. guys are in this club. And, right. But it I like, me, the creatures. I, I like that description, that you got me with that. You cool. set the hook. I do I've like the sound of it. Like horror say to me that they, you know, they can't stand horror. They're not big horror fans. That does, and, that's kind of a, a kind of a crossover between, you know, like a thriller, murder mystery, and you bring in the paranormal side of it too. So it it it's it's not straight up horror. It, you know yeah. what I mean? So it's it it it's got a different aspect to it. Well, I was heavily now, influenced by uh, Salem's Lot. I loved that book. Yep. Okay, and and the, he really did it. Stephen King did a great job of, you know, basing it. All the characters doubting themselves as to this could really be happening. I love that aspect of it. Yeah, that yeah. So I just pulled up the Kirkus review in the last sentence. Well, first of all, one of the last sentences says, uh, "Blah blah." Readers, um, Parker drops them into a tautly written story that runs full tilt. So you can thank your editor for that for the tautly <laughs> part, right? Because it's nice and taut. And then the last one, a tense, action-packed tale of snarling teeth, razor-sharp claws, and entertaining mayhem. Nice. So you, that's, that's awesome. That's a, that is a great that's, description. Seriously, that's an awesome. And it, again, to to what you said before. Nice save. I saved it. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't say to your point, but I'll drink anyway. Ah, cheers. Uh, cheers. Like it takes much. I know. Um <laughs> But what you were saying, but you know, before is is this is a big deal. Getting a a, a Kirk, that's awesome. You know, a Kirkus review that's that positive is fantastic. That's, yeah, that's I'm awesome. So thrilled, man. so thrilled. Especially because you self published. Like it's one thing to you know to get it on a, a big publishing. You know, it, it's totally different when it's self published. Yeah, it feels good. It feels good. That's well, I mean, like I'm you, gonna, uh, I got to remake the cover with one of those quotes on the top. 
Definitely. Exactly. Definitely. Yeah. And like you said, this is 10 years in the making. So, th- yeah. you know, that's that's a lot of work that you put in, a lot of blood, sweat, and tears, you know, behind that. So, you know, good yeah. for you. Now, where is the best place for people to buy your book? Amazon, Amazon. probably? Yeah. Yeah, Amazon. All right. And, and uh, for the... F- for oh, those of you li- for those of you listening, if you'd like to yeah. purchase a copy of the book, I will have a link in the show notes. Just click on there and grab your copy of the book. It sounds like an amazing thriller. Yeah. Um, you know, you all know my love of the paranormal, but I am telling you <laughs> right now, I am definitely going to read this book because yeah. I like the detective side of it, the thriller side of it. I mean, that really interests me. So, And isn't it crazy that it all comes out of just an experience in your real life? Like yeah. your son wanting to see a wolf, you know, a wolf, werewolf. Man, a werewolf at, at a zoo triggers this thing to make you write a book. It's crazy. Yeah. That's like, it's and, like comedy, you know. You see something yeah. and it sparks, and and just right. think, in a few years, he's going to sue you for residuals. <laughs> <laughs> if you knew my son, that wouldn't be funny because I can see him doing that. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, so Todd, now that you're down in Atlanta, is there a comedy scene down there? Is there a pretty strong comedy scene? Are you in it, or uh, are you? There is a comedy scene. I um, I wouldn't say that I'm in it. I I take part in it now and then. Basically, yep. uh, when I really need a hit, when I need a, the urge, when the itch, you know, I, I go out and I'll hit one of these one nighters. Yeah. And, uh, and I always I always have fun. Um, but I'll, I'll tell you a funny story. So um, Bill, Bill Burr, whenever Bill comes through town, mm-hmm. he's really cool. And he like has me open up. He throws me up on stage. Yeah. And um, but before that happens, I usually have like a month or two notice. And I don't want to be all rusty, so I'll go to one of these of little mic nights and I'll you yep. know, try out some new stuff. I don't want to do the same old shit again. So about three months ago, right before the you know Bill's Fenway gig, yeah, um, he was doing some, he was doing giggles and he was doing nicks, and I was going to yep. open up for him and yeah. giggle. So I wanted to go stretch my legs out, and I go to this place that I'd never been before, and it's it's uh, it's a it's a room with a bunch of fold up chairs, and only comics like all open micers there's no audience like they are the audience it's like, just they're, yeah. they're all 20 fucking years old and they come in and i'm <laughs> sitting there by myself and i'm watching them just nostalgic just like remembering what it was like to be them and yeah. they're all thinking they're the funniest things in the world they're pranking each other you know and and i'm just not really you know no one's talking to me and that's fine i'm just taking yeah. it all you're the old guy in the corner of the room yeah, exactly. <laughs> And they're, they all start to sit down. They're going to start in like 10 minutes or so. And and they're loudly bashing cruise comics. Like you're shitting on cruise oh, comics because yeah. they all think they're going to be like Kevin Hart. Like everyone. Oh, of them, course. You know? Yeah. So yeah. I saw my opportunity. So I said, hey, I, you know, I've got a friend who's a cruise comic. And one of them turned around and said, whatever you say, person, nobody knows. <laughs> oh, oh, that's fucking awesome. Oh. <laughs> Oh. I, actually, I was like shocked, but at, at the same time, it was hilarious. Yes. Right, right. So I laughed. Yep. And then that was it. So then I went up and I just kind of shit all over them. I didn't yeah. really practice any bits that I wanted to do. Right. Yeah. You're like, all right, fuck you, asshole. Yeah. It was it, it really talk about being brought down to earth. Like, wow. Uh, yeah. <laughs> See, now I would have been like, yeah, I know. I know you don't know me. You might know my friend that I'm opening up for next month, Bill fucking Burr, you little prick. Oh, well, <laughs> no, you got to give re- you got to give respect to that. When That's it? such a good burn. Wait a minute, when was it? That was uh maybe 4 months ago. It was right, it was uh, 2 weeks before the Fenway gig, whenever that was. Oh, it was right before the Fenway gig. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I did that after the show. After the show, one of them came, we were standing outside and Oh, them, and oh, they, okay. Yeah, oh. and he said, uh, "Hey, man, that was really funny." And I said, "Oh, thanks." Like, he goes, uh, "So I've never seen you before. Are you, are you from here?" And I said, well, "I'm doing a gig next month, and I just wanted to practice for it." And he goes, "Oh, what are you doing next month?" I said, "I'm going up to Boston. I'm going to open up for Bill Burr." And he goes, "What?" And I said, "I'm going I'm opening for Bill Burr." And then, you know, it was like I said, I was opening for Elvis. Like this, yeah, kid. right. Oh, yeah. yeah, to them, of course. And he is like, "Well, how, how did you how did you get that?" And I went, "He called me." He's like, what? What are you telling? And then, you know, little by little, like, yeah, I would have been like, you may not know me, but he does. And that's all that fucking matters. (laughs) (laughs) Whatever you say, person, nobody knows. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> oh my god that's gonna be the title of the episode it's gonna be yes. like todd parker 
the guy who nobody knows. Yes. Except <laughs> Bill Burr. Except Bill Burr. You got to add that in. <laughs> Oh, oh don't the guy, the guy only Bill Burr knows. Yeah. <laughs> oh, please don't do that. He'll rip the shit out of me. He will bust uh, my ass about that forever. Oh, that's so funny though. <laughs> that I, funny. I'm sorry. That's a great burn. That's a great. That, burn. That's, that is a great burn. <laughs> that's so funny. So listen, man. First of all, we really appreciate giving us the time. Uh, but we we usually end the show by asking our our guest about you know obviously you've had some high points low points we've all had them in our careers so we always ask our guest about the funny bad gig story and that's the gig that wasn't funny the night of but the further away you get from it it becomes funnier so like you're sitting in the green room with a bunch of comics and everyone's telling their war stories of you know the shit gigs that they've done and honestly the last story you just told could have been one of them <laughs> by getting heckled by some fucking open <laughs> micer in atlanta uh but but it's it's that gig that like the further away you get everyone's sharing stories in the green room and you're like oh you think that's bad let me tell you this one and by the end of it everyone is laughing their asses off um i think i'll win this one okay I oh I like uh, this. Yeah. Uh, right before I moved to LA, I was willing to take any any amount of money for I mean any gig for any amount of money. Yep. You guys ever hear of Spooky World? Yeah. Oh yeah. Spooky Project. World. Yes. Foxborough, okay. right? No, it was up in uh, Clinton, Mass, or something I like that. I don't know where it is now. Yeah. But yeah. this was, it was in Berlin, Mass. Berlin, oh, yeah, Mass. Yeah, it's, was it. it's moved to a few different yeah. locations. But no, yeah. the, the original one was in Berlin. Yeah. And this was the first year. And the guy who owned it hired me to do stand up for the crowd as they were waiting for the hayride. <laughs> oh my God. Okay. All right. All right. We might have oh, a winner. No. It's, it's, uh, <laughs> it's to this day when Robbie Prince and I are talking, I'll say, like, man, I was wishing I was back at Spooky World. <laughs> <laughs> oh but it my was, God. Uh, I've never heard any story that can compare to it. Like, it was. And it was hours. I had it was every night for a month. Oh my god! Or from I think seven to eleven, where oh. I would alternate with the karaoke guy. Like he'd do forty five, I'd do forty five, over and over again. Oh and my god! It, it's October in in Boston. It's like twenty degrees out. These people are not happy. Right. You know, there's hundreds of them standing in line in this big roped off square, and I've got I was about five feet up, and. As I'm doing my thing, uh, I've got all these like idiots down below me handing me their song sheets that they want to sing for karaoke. Oh. <laughs> they had like these, they had these teenagers dressed like witches going yep. through the crowd, handing out candy to keep everybody like from realizing they're standing in 20 degree weather. So those things are just being chucked at me left and right. Like I'm like <laughs> I'm like trying to work the crowd. So hey, hey, wait for a bit, and, and they're they're getting me like every third minute. They're just like yeah, with these candy bars. That was just the, the worst ever. I mean, I, I had like panic attacks. Like, every day. And, like oh I'd be looking God. at the clock like, oh, I don't have to leave yet. I don't have to leave yet. Like, oh. And oh. and ple- were you getting paid, what, $25 a night? <laughs> no, the pay, the pay was good. The pay was good. All right. Really? All right. I like- yeah, the pay was good, but uh, I earned it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You still, you still question whether or not See, it was worth it, <laughs> and and that's one of the things we've brought up on here many, many times is people think you can just put comedy anywhere. Right. They think yeah. we'll just plop a comedian in and they'll make it work in, right. in my sports bar, in my parking lot, at yeah. Spooky World, yeah. and they'll just make it work. We can just right. plug it in anywhere. And, they don't and get it. We don't need much. To, you know, to, for comedians, we don't need a lot, but the things we need are so important to make a comedy show work. They're so yeah. vital yeah. for for a show, like for a, a positive experience for the crowd, like a sound system. Yeah, you know that would help for a crowd that are gathered <laughs> right? for a comedy show. That they know why they're there, and it's for a comedy show. So, and, and they're paying attention. So, I, Tom, well, go ahead, go ahead. I think I have one more real quick one. Yeah, no, oh, go please. ahead. We we love them. Robbie We're Prince compiling these into a book, by the way. We're going to compile all of the, the best of the funny stories. bad gig stories. <laughs> Robbie Prince and I together had to do a two man show at South Station at lunchtime. Like what? Billy Downs, I think, booked it. And of course he did. Yeah. We're on the <laughs> Brother, I'll book a bus station. <laughs> it was awful. I mean, no one's even stopping. There was no. No, like, they're, they're walking, walking through. Around. They're trying and to catch the next song on guitar, you know. What, what do they so call it? Oh, you're, you're, 
there's these things, you know, it's terrible. Yeah. That's like in New York City when they call it busking yeah. when, when they're playing comedy, guitar and stuff Comedy like that. busking. You're doing comedy busking at South <laughs> oh <my> Station. <laughs> that could be a title, too. Todd Parker, comedy, comedy busker. busker. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Well, it's funny. I was I wanted to share with you because we were talking about Larry Rapucci earlier, mm-hmm. and I think I might have worked with him once. And all I just... I just remember the stories that I hear about him is he's absolutely crazy. And he, <laughs> Tom Cotter, when we had Tom Cotter on, he talked about this gig where they got hired at a college and it was a memorial or some sort no, of like, it was you for, tell it better. Go it, ahead. <laughs> it was for um, <clears throat> sexual abuse awareness weekend. This is already hilarious. Yeah, right. And yeah. the whole idea of the weekend was to bring up awareness about sexual abuse on college campuses and stuff right. like that. And it was on a college campus. And people would get up and they would tell their story about uh-huh. a sexual abuse experience or potential one. And then they would pin a T-shirt with their name on a board that was on the back side of the stage. And so they're they're doing all these stories and stuff. And then the comedy show starts and Rapucci walks up on stage and looks back, looks back at the wall of these paper T-shirts <laughs> that are pinned up. And uh, he goes, he goes, well, looks like if you get late enough at this college, they retire your jersey. <laughs> And, and it was a Catholic university. Yeah, yeah. And the priest walks up and takes the mic out of his hand and goes, we're, show over. We're done. We're done. <laughs> and this is the beginning of the show. This is the f- beginning of the show. Cotter it was just like, started. Cotter was like, I didn't even get to do a, a set. He goes, I, I never walked on, on stage. stage. <laughs> he was the first comic. He was the opener. And, and the, pre- <laughs> the Monsignor takes the mic out of his hand and goes, that's it. We're done. Show's <laughs> over. <laughs> He goes, wow, and some, I'm sorry. Some school, I guess if you get late enough, they retire your jersey. Oh. <laughs> and I'm sorry. I know I know. in today's climate that shouldn't be funny, oh. but you know, as a comic with our dark sense of humor, that's a fucking funny oh, line. Yeah. I'm it's, sorry. It's a yeah. god-awful thing it's to horrible. say, but the balls to say it in front of that crowd after they just told these stories is oh. like the Mount Everest of balls to say <laughs> something like that. He has the biggest balls of oh, any. Yeah. I mean, the expression, I don't give a fuck, is like made for him. He right. literally does not give a shit about it, anything. It, it, that, I don't know if that I don't give a fuck is strong enough right, yeah, you, you right. know, for him to walk out and say that. Now, you know? now, I've seen you post about him on online because I think for a while people were wondering if he was still alive, if he, you know, yeah. what happened. So was it you that kind of tracked him down and found out he is he is alive? I was he just, him, but I didn't track him. Somebody else tracked him down. He was in touch oh, okay. with somebody else. He is, he is alive. Okay. <laughs> he's just he's not on social media or anything like that, right? Right. right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, he's just, there's so many different Larry Rapucci stories that you could go to. He's just, he told me once he, 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 he was always working as a waiter. That was his primary job most of the time. Yeah. And if he, if he didn't like it after a certain amount of time, he would just, you know, go up to the manager and the manager, he'd say, you know, I, I'm not, this isn't for me. And the manager would say, well, thanks for giving me your two weeks notice. And he'd go, I'm giving you two, two minutes notice. <laughs> Walk out. Just leave. You would just leave. You would say things to people that you don't say. That, forget nowadays. I mean, even back uh, then, he once he was told a waitress that if she, she was bugging him about something, and she was going out with the owner, and he went up to the owner and said, uh, "Can we talk about your girlfriend?" And he says, "What's what's the matter?" And he said, uh, "She's busting my balls, and if she doesn't stop, I'm going to stab her in the chest and fuck the wound." <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> Oh, and oh, in his head, he's thinking that the manager's going to go, well, I'll talk to her. You know, <laughs> yeah, you're yeah, right. right. You're yeah. Right. <laughs> oh, my like, God. Like, oh, I'm sorry that's happening. I'll handle that yeah, right away. Me, oh, I, I'm, so, I'm so sorry, Larry. Let me go talk to her now. <laughs> yeah. Can I talk to HR, please? <laughs> She's getting on my nerves. Oh, my God. That's so awesome. The intros he would give when he was hosting. Oh, Jesus. He. Do you guys remember Nancy Monroe? Yeah, yes. I remember Nancy. Yeah, she was married to Ken Rogerson for a while. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. She's passed away, unfortunately. She was yeah. just an awesome person. Yeah. So funny. 
And one time we were talking about who, you know, who do you like bringing you up? Who brings you up the best, the worst? And she said, Laura Pucci once brought me up as saying, this next comedian is a girl, which is good because I'd rather eat pussy than suck cock. Nancy Monroe. (laughs) (laughs) And that's why I seem to remember him in the very, very beginning. But I don't know. I don't know if he ever came down to Rhode Island or not. But as soon as people start telling stories about him, (laughs) I seem to vaguely remember this completely inappropriate comic that used to make me laugh. And I didn't. And and then someone said the name Larry Rapucci, and I'm like, the name sounds familiar, but I didn't work with him enough to know him. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah, he well, was so funny. He's legendary. <laughs> well, you know, it's funny because they talk about one of the great things in comedy is building up, you know, that uncomfortableness with the crowd, and then releasing it with the punchline. He he would create the uncomfortableness and then push it over the edge with his right <laughs> with the end. Of he it. wouldn't release he, it with he the would crowd. never release it he would just push it over no, the edge but make he, it worse but he would <laughs> he would release it with the comics yeah <laughs> that's why yeah. everyone talks yeah. about him still yeah. 30 years later that's too funny do you oh. remember do you remember louis ck's first show not the louis one but the lucky one louis on hbo lucky yeah louis. lucky yeah. louis and the jim norton character oh yeah, yeah. The jim norton character is based on larry rapucci is it really yeah Oh my God! Yeah, that makes I sense. I did not. I did not know that. That he, makes sense. And, and, and ma- together, Louis, Louis. I was in touch with Louis at the time, and he said, "Hey, do you have a way to get in touch with Larry Pucci?" And I said, "Yeah." And he's like, uh, oh, "Give me his info." And I gave him his info, and because uh, he wanted him to play that part. Oh really? Yeah. For some reason, it didn't work out. I don't know why. But um, <laughs> yeah. Um, well, actually, you, <laughs> I could probably imagine fourteen reasons of why it didn't work yeah. out. Right. <laughs> I guess if you place Larry Pucci in a production meeting with a bunch of suits. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh, my exactly. God. Oh, my God. That was. Oh. Dude, thank you so much for being on. We can't thank you enough. This was so much fun. I hope you had fun, too. I had a blast, man. This was awesome. really fun. I, haven't, I had a great time. Thanks for having me. Yeah. No, appreciate and so, it. So listen, uh, if you, you know what, look at the show notes. Uh, billionaire Boogie Men. Not Boogeyman. Boogeyman. Uh, you don't want to read about George Soros. There's enough shit out there about him. Yes, but exactly. But Billionaire Boogeyman is uh, Todd Parker's new book, uh, getting great reviews. So go on Amazon, buy it. Uh, very, very funny. And uh, very funny. I mean, very, very good, uh, well-written book. And I'm sitting here thinking as I'm th- as I'm thinking through, we should have you back on next Scottober and talk about it again. I love uh, it. I you, love it. You know. That'd be cool. Yeah, definitely. Because we actually, uh, the last Scottober, we had uh, David Naughton on. Uh, speaking Joe of, Larry. yeah, yeah. We, got him through, we got him through Jackie Flynn. We had yeah. Jackie Flynn on, and mm-hmm. this guy, David Naughton, reaches out to me on Facebook and goes, hey, I'm a friend of, La- uh, you know, of, uh, of Jackie Flynn's. I saw he's going to be on your podcast. I can't wait to watch. And I'm, I'm going... Why does this name sound so familiar? And then I look up his picture and I'm like, he even looks familiar. And then I look at his like other pictures and I'm like, it's the fucking guy from American Werewolf in London. Holy shit. Yeah. And hot do- Honestly, when we had him on, <laughs> we thought it was going to be all about American Werewolf in London. We talked more about Hot Dog the movie because we were both 13 year old boys when that came out. I told him I ruined many gym socks because of oh that my movie. God. Hot- and <laughs> skiing and, and naked women in hot tubs was that whole movie. It was so funny. But he was such a great guest. Yeah, he was and told awesome. us some awesome stories. Oh, and, he must have a ton of stories. Yeah. Oh, and and he was very open and very cordial. Yeah. And he, he was so good. He and was he's so uh, good. He's actually not far from me. He's well, not far. He's in North Carolina. Oh, really? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. He lives in North Carolina now. So, but uh, but yeah, no, we'll we'll definitely we'll love to have you on. By then, uh, maybe you're working on your second book. By then, hey, you never maybe. know. You never know. So. Well, listen, man, thanks so much for being on, Todd. We really appreciate, appreciate it. Appreciate it. It was great. Had a, and had a great time. Thanks. Thank a- you, Todd. Anytime you want to reminisce, let us know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we'll do. Maybe you can get uh, uh, Larry on and you oh guys can God. come on as a tandem. <laughs> oh, yeah. Track down Larry Rapucci. I think yeah, I think that would really do a solid episode of Larry Rapucci or Noxie. Let me know. I, I'm All in. right. 
Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, we've been talking about the Noxie one for a while. So that would be, we would definitely get a bunch of different people to tell their Noxie stories in your end if we ever put that together. Please do. I've got a yeah, plan. Yeah. Yes. That'd be awesome. All right, man. Hey, thanks so much, Todd. We really appreciate it. Nighty night, guys. All right. See you, man. And that was Todd Parker. That was awesome. It was, and you know, it's so funny how even when you're talking to someone who, you know, like I said, I, I hadn't worked with him. Yeah, I didn't came, know him at all. We came across, but we're we're all brothers in comedy like we know so many of the so same totally people comfortable. came yeah. up in the same scene so we have we even though like you said we don't know each other directly yeah we we feel like we know each other because we all went through the similar same experiences exactly. came up through the same area and you know even though i started a decade or more after you after, guys yeah i still worked with all these guys i still worked at a lot of these clubs right. i know all these people so you know it it Man, what I, I love listening to those yeah. old stories. But I love the fact that, you know, we talk about what's behind the funny and the fact that he wrote a book that has nothing to do with comedy, but it's an artistic outlet. Like we said, artistic right. people want different outlets. So one outlet is comedy. One outlet is writing. But one outlet is art. I didn't know he taught art. You can kind of follow the path from comedy to the writing that he's doing. Like he mm -hmm. said, some scripts and stuff like that. Then he's using his comedy background on the videos that he was doing yeah. and stuff. Yeah. And it just follows this path that leads up to this book that it, that he put together. Exactly. So it makes sense. Was, it makes sense. So it was, it was a great, great night, and I, I really enjoyed getting to know him. So. And we hope you guys enjoyed it as well. So. And, and again, if you're into, to uh, you know, like I said, that book is, you know, while it has a paranormal theme, it also has a detective type of theme, a thriller type of theme. It kind of covers a bunch of different genres, and it's yeah. really got a, a cool, vibe, you know, interest to it. And I, I'm, I'm definitely going to order it myself yeah, and, and read it because it sounds really good. Me too. So, uh, the sh it, go to the show notes, check out the link to Amazon where you can buy the book. Yep. Um, check it out, and if you do, let us know what you think. Yeah, we'd, we'd love to hear back from you guys on, on what you guys think, and you yeah, know, because we'll reach back out to Todd and let him know. Hey, and we got a and, couple of reviews, and we'll for share you, you uh, with you guys what we think on it when, yeah. after we read it. So. So listen, folks, we know it, it was said at the beginning of the episode, but we really appreciate, uh, you know, you guys listening, anyone who watches. Uh, we've got next week coming up is the long awaited mixtape podcast. I double can't episode. Wait. I can't wait. We've been talking one. with these guys and we've become fans of theirs and they've become fans of ours because I was going back and forth with Matt uh, and he was saying, uh, oh, man, I love this episode. I love that episode. So. It's going to be a lot of fun. It's going to be a crossover episode. We're going to talk to those guys about how they started their podcast and how they, uh, you know, kind of got together. And then we're going to do uh, kind of an episode of theirs because, as we said, it's the mixtape podcast. So they do a lot on 80s and 90s. And they had brought up on one of their shows about, you know, the recent uh, documentary about Woodstock 99 on Netflix. And I told them I was at Woodstock 99. Yeah, Ace was the one that started the fire. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I had left by then. <laughs> but uh, but I, uh, I, I definitely, um, you know, remember some pretty amazing wacky shit that happened there yeah. even though we left early my ex and i left early but it's gonna be, so it's fun. Gonna be fun it's gonna be a lot of fun with those guys so, something, something a little different but you know still uh you know behind the funny so yeah. you know we're gonna we're really gonna enjoy doing that one so check that out next yep. week don't forget we still have the contest going give us that five-star written review you can win a copy of the seinfeld cookbook signed by one of the authors and a behind the funny t-shirt so don't yes. forget that we have some entries we want some more so we can make sure that we have plenty of people to pull a name out of the hat so that we can send that to you uh by the end of next month so and uh other than that we will talk to you next week mm -hmm.